delighted to move our program to our next session, uh, which is the session seven titled as Global Trends in Digital Infrastructure and Cybersecurity. Dr. Brian Canada is the moderator, session moderator, is chair of the Department of Computer Science and Associate Professor for Computer National Science in University of South Carolina, Beaufort. I have had an opportunity of working with USC Beaufort for the last five years, and I work with Brian uh, constantly on several projects, and I thank him for putting this wonderful program. And uh, Stephanie Mayberry is Vice President for Odex USA. She uh, was uh, kind enough to join us uh, yesterday, so thank you, thank you, Stephanie. Uh, Mr. C.B. Valuthan from uh, his Global Managing Director of Strategic Alliance Equinix. We thank uh, partnership with C.B. and Equinix for helping us to put this program and our programs in the past. Mr. Flavio Villanstere, he's VP Technology and CISO for Relix Distinguished Technologies for Lexus, Nexus, Relix Solutions Group. A wonderful panel. Welcome to you all. Uh, Dr. Canada, all yours. Thank you so much. So well, welcome everyone. Um, as, uh, as Ani mentioned, I'm the chair of the computer science and now computer science and mathematics department at the University of South Carolina, Beaufort. Our department has um, uh, a number of academic programs, including Bachelor of Science in Computational Science, which is a relatively new major at the undergraduate level. Uh, it's only about 10 or 15 uh, years old in terms of its offerings throughout the world as an undergraduate major anyway. Normally it's a graduate discipline uh, where students will learn things like high performance computing, data mining, and more advanced computational tools. Everybody is talking about uh, cyber. It seems to be, it's the big trend, right? Um, I recently mentioned to a few people that uh, cyber attacks are the number one thing on everyone's mind. Bringing everything into the news, uh, we've seen a lot of discussion. You know, what is the best way forward? Uh, how are we going to address these attacks? Uh, well, let's look at the data. Next, Ani. So you've got money and we're gonna to have to put it somewhere. Where are we going to focus our efforts, correct? So we've got budget uh, companies of, of all sizes. Um, but you know, if you look at the data, that's where I always like to drive everything to the facts. Again, here's the numbers, right? So everyone's been talking about, well, when was the first hack? It was actually number one in 89. But look how quickly in 2019, we've come to nearly 10 billion, right? It's not going down. There's more and more types of software and tools flooding the market, but our numbers are not decreasing with our threats. We're now at 20 million new threats per month. Honey? So you must appropriately design the a solution uh, to the problem, file-based attacks. People aren't uh, ne necessarily focusing always on a file-based attack, but that's actually where most of the files and uh, are sending the threats coming in. So file-based attacks, uh, these are the code coming in with something that's seemingly unharmless uh, that would actually could take down uh, an entire corporation. And as I mentioned, uh, where are they coming from? <laughs> so we've got a, a, a large initiative now in the US to disable macros. Unfortunately, we have a lot of people that do use macros and will need to receive their macros. So how do you go about doing that? How do you get down to granularity and determine what you're going to allow into your domain and not? Next. So, Initially, this is sort of like I, I call the evolution of cybersecurity protection, right? You, we had the antivirus tools initially. I sort of look at that as, you know, you go to a doctor, they give you a prescription for a known illness. But what about the unknown? They don't have a script for that. So when antivirus goes out and updates their signatures, that's what it's doing. Then we have sandboxing, right? And then sandboxing, we thought, okay, uh, we can, you know, put some isolation here. That still didn't resolve anything. 
CDR, uh, the content disarm and reconstruction, is actually the, the latest trend or our newest technology in, in combating these type of threats. So here's a, an example. Uh, go ahead, Ani, you can hit it and see that a file is uh, sent through an antivirus. Okay. Um, and you'll, previously, you'll see the legacy antivirus would scan it and then make a determination. Uh, known malware, it's not going to allow it into the corporate system. Honey? Okay, so that seemed pretty easy, right? Okay, next. Okay, well, let's try again. Honey? So, the legacy antivirus is scanning your, your, your documents. Let's see, uh-oh, unknown. So we have a zero day or unknown malware. There's no prescription for it. it. It doesn't even recognize it. So what happens, Sonny? It allows the file to pass right into your network. I think you'll have to hit once more for that animation. Okay, next. So what do we do? Okay, you've got the legacy antivirus and you know it was what we had at the time. But then they started doing some types of researches and they figured out uh, that the, the they that you can combine different antiviruses because certain ones were specializing in certain areas. So legacy antivirus alone didn't work. Next slide. However, if we use the multiple antiviruses, uh, well, that, that helped, but it still didn't work with zero days. And we found there was a huge increase in false positives. Next. So again, we've got a little animation, so you'll have to click this a few times, Annie, and you'll see sandboxing, what happened then. I don't know if a lot of people have actually done this type of detail analytics on the uh, evolution of the, the type of prevention that we've been using. But, you know, the file will go to the sandbox and get blocked. Okay. Now, let's try the unknown. One more time, Annie, and put it into the sandbox, and let's see what happens. Well, it, it, you know, all this does is reduce business continuity and, and puts a lot of people uh, to work looking through sandboxes, what, you know, how long we're going to quarantine something, should we release it? Okay, next. So we increased the antivirus, uh, added more. We had increased false positives and it didn't really resolve our issues. We're, we're getting the malware uh, into our systems. Next. So here's the new one, the CDR. So what will CDR do that's very different? So CDR is actually going to look at file typing. It's sort of like, you know, you, you're looking at a JPEG. Does it look like a JPEG? Does it have pixels? Well, there's lots of different types of CDR out there. All endpoints, uh, CDR um, and the endpoint protection will not do the same function. So in this case, everyone's thinking, oh, you know, I've got an endpoint, I've got a gateway, everything's okay. Now, see what happens? So you've got now people saying, well, I've got, you know, an endpoint, I'm even running antivirus, uh, and, you know, I've checked the box, I should be okay. No, it's the file-based attacks that are still getting through. Now, with the true CDR, as you can see, the animation again, it's going to come through and it's going to look at file types. But, you know, as I said, all CDR is not the same. You have to take it to a, an extreme algorithm and see, is this document truly the document it says it will? It, it is. Now, how is it going to combat the unknown? Okay, that's an easy one. It's not looking for detection. It's preventing. So if there's something in the file that shouldn't be there, it's going to remove it. Now, it's not looking for a known signature, so it doesn't have to know it's there. Sounds pretty easy, right? So what we've determined is it, it, you can use a combination of all, and that's where we are today. Uh, you can run your antivirus, you can have some sandboxing, I always think that a CDR uh, for file sanitization is something you would do to, um, you know, like if you have a sieve and things are passing through all your, your layers, 
The CDR is going to catch it at the end. It's going to stop that file from entering your system, but it's going to allow business continuity. Okay. So again, this is uh, one of the areas I was just mentioning, but it's, it's a combination strategy for moving forward. And as usual, I always like to state that it's not just about technology, right? It's people, processes, our procedures, our culture. And by the time you put it all together, then we can build a safer network. Now, I'm on the mindset that we cannot be continuously 100% protected. But what we can be is vigilant and put those barriers in place. And as you can see, it's a much more sustainable system when you have different types of software and tools looking for the different types of malware that are coming through. You know, I always say catch the low hanging fruit with the antivirus and then, you know, let it pass through all of the different types of areas. So again, um, file-based attacks are here to stay. We've got 20 million new ones a month. So we need to look at a different way of considering our cyber stack. All right, hopefully we'll all uh, go out there and revisit our stacks and see where we may have some vulnerabilities. Thanks for having me today. Thank you. Can you hear me? Really? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Fantastic. Hey, great. As always, to be associated with this uh, event. Um, uh, it's been a few years now uh, to be part of it. So, Ani, um, Dr. John, Brian, all of you, great to see you all again, and and the opportunity to talk to uh, you know the teams that uh, and the audiences out here uh, in a way. Uh, I, I'm CB CB Velaitan. Uh, work with Equinix. Have been in the uh, business of building infrastructure, uh, transforming lives through that in different parts of the world, uh, in, in in multiple companies and in thousand countries. So excited for just the possibility and the fact that infrastructure building networks is such an is one of those things that can never go out of fashion if you may uh in a way you just have to land up actually building more if not less on it so it's it's one of those things there while stephanie while you were talking about some of those attacks around uh and starting in 1989 from the first one to now you said over 10 billion a couple of things that i thought of was one, I wish my portfolio grew the same way from one to two uh, was one. The second one, it almost looked like any startup in the Valley. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm also based here in, uh, in the Valley here. This is home for me. So, you know, work, I mean, Equinix, again, it's a company that I work with, which is a startup, 25 years old startup. Uh, we still believe as we are in, in terms of what we are, but also it's just, you know, some of the companies here, the kind of rapid growth that they have just shows um, you know, what some of these attacks can create and cause and what it, what they land up doing, you know, in a way, just, just leaving that unfettered. To do that, though, I mean, one of the things that people need to, if that's not already a wake-up call, uh, Stephanie, about just the risk of it, the other elements is just the world around us and just how things are changing. I mean, and they've, if anything, the COVID has just brought that more front and center, but I would almost say, it's even before the cold COVID, just the way the pace in which digital transformation is happening, at least in the last decade or more, I think it's been like the attacks just been exponential in, in a way that it's been growing. And I think as companies, industries, firms, people land up having to get used to this new reality, I think they need to kind of come back to one of the, my old favorite topics that I started off is how do you build that up from a from a platform or an infrastructure that can actually take care of all the changes happening and at the same time all the all the kind of bad actors if you may that want to kind of leverage in and also take take a piece of that and drive that so that's i think is an important piece for us to uh, look at any out a few slides if we wanted to flash them off if not I can kind of keep going on also in a way. But so so that is just the thing that we need to look at. The world is changing like crazy. Things like um, digital first is no longer a buzzword. Any, com any com company I would say is that almost wants to exist needs to keep that front and center and drive that. Customers are changing, usage is changing. And you know, just the products that used to be traditionally what companies were identified with or associated with is also changing. So 
how do you bring all that into a kind of a into a, into a, into a, uh, into a base that lands up becoming relevant is is i think got to to figure out what to do but there's always for any opportunity there's a challenge in terms of what it is whether it's growing the volume of data that's just growing exponentially whether just speed and agility and agility and speed are not just the intent of people but just also in terms of how do you execute on this uh, agility and speed because we didn't do that you're almost going to be wiped out literally overnight because you can have new people coming in and kind of coming and replacing organizations almost overnight so that's another piece of a uh, piece that people need to kind of keep always thinking of about how do i become more faster and agile being faster and agile having an intent and in executing that is good also but that actually as always comes with a cost you i mean you can't indefinitely and just infinitely try to keep increasing your speed to even if you want it you've got to find ways in kind of keeping the other side of the valve of the of the equation uh, in control which is cost and if you didn't if you didn't do that then that lands up you know kind of catching up on you uh, very quickly so i thought i'll just talk about how does an organization uh with all the stuff that you know stephanie you talked about some of this but also about the whole digital how do they need to kind of actually set themselves up in this new world what what is it what are the kind of key things that are required for that and so honey if you actually move on to the next line you, you, you know what we believe in in in, uh, in equinex is that for companies to be successful in this world we can no longer be islands of our own destiny we the, the whole world is all about being connected to each other the economies are connected customers are connected supply chains are connected so we believe it's almost the, the backbone of a digital world is being interconnected and the more we are interconnected is where you're going to land up becoming more successful and it's got a whole host of benefits that come with it but it also got a whole host of ingredients that people need to look at when they want to get into being you know to be able to leverage that and we at equinix believe that's almost a core for a digital platform to be successful and having a digital platform that's successful is almost directly related and proportional to a company or an organization being successful so they're all they're also interlinked in a way and that's why we think we stress on this to say if you want to be successful make sure you're able to kind of drive that and move forward with that so only moving on into the next slide and that's kind of where uh, equinix as a company we pride ourselves in actually being the world digital infrastructure company yes which is in the right places with the right partners and also with the right possibilities of being able to enable the journey that any organization wants to take on in in being successful in this new digital world that they want to kind of be part of and drive and manage in a way uh while we do this um you know my son's favorite uh, um cartoon character is spider-man and we talk about with great power comes great responsibilities so one thing that we cannot forget is that as leaders digital in growing your digital footprint also has an off as another side to it which is that it it'll, we've got to be sensible responsible corporate citizens in the world so and if you move on into the the other slide there is not only danger of speed and cost and all of that there is a serious issue about what impact does that have on the environment what are we all doing as we just try to kind of become digitally you know try to drive on this digital amount of data and others what does it do with the with the environment that's something that we cannot afford not to do in the last uh revolutions of modern ways of industrialization that happened we saw what happened when industrialization takes over and we are still kind of paying the brunt for it the environment is being the brunt for it and we're doing it we cannot afford to have the same kind of things as we go on the digital journey now and we need to be very conscious of that and that's something even as a company we are very very clear that you know we want to be you know corporate citizens and responsible around it in terms of using 100% you know clean renewable energy for example just one data fact that i could say is that we have actually been able to avoid the equivalent of over 400000 uh cars worth of carbon emission in the world just in the last year so you know for us as we grow while actually doubling the amount of power that we have used in the data centers that we have so while we've been able to grow on our capacities and and solutions we provide we're also trying to be able to make sure we're not leaving a, a footprint that has an impact on on the on the world uh, in general so that's just one element of it i just wanted to ani if you move on and kind of just um echoing in on stephanie's point on cyber security and on security while digital infrastructure platforms are important so just one number that popped up here to say is that you look eyed at a survey and they found that 78% of the companies believe 
that you know the, the risks and data protection are are just increasing now the thing that kind of struck out on that whole chart of all these numbers is that what happened to the other 22% of the companies which probably don't believe that it's actually increasing again as in cyber security that i think i think it's about us to make sure that they've got to get into a wake, wake up call because there is a very crude analogy that you know for any company at any point you're either under attack or you don't know that you're under attack those are the only two stages of existence that you're in so for people who think that they are very secure they just need to go back and look at it because as this is these things are um, you know kind of very prevalent around in terms of just what it is and even here if you actually go to the next slide ani um, where you know what we think is that going from this very haphazard un unorganized way of how organ, our organizations have been growing with the multiple areas of uh, the risks that are there in in terms of just how they set up and this has been a function of just how they've been growing i think and if you move on there isn't there is clearly an opportunity for organizations to be able to be well interconnected distributed and also through that be able to manage uh, the, the 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 their, their whole data flow within their organizations as they have and how they drive that and this is i think a critical piece for companies to keep in mind as they build out their infrastructure and i keep coming back to that because that's the fundamental building block for any company as it wants to kind of exist so moving on ani um, into just some of the it's almost like a checklist of what any company needs to do as they build this platform is that they need to make sure as they go for global coverage in terms of just being able to reach everywhere and access markets and customers that they don't have and our partners they also need to make sure that they're interconnected with a robust ecosystem that they can leverage on and have the right controls and be able to drive that because those are all kind of key important key pieces that they need to kind of keep in mind on and in terms of just where they are so i just wanted to end it on the last one as probably give um, a classic example of one of the industries which uh, probably has security top of mind and if you move on to the one to the next slide uh is 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 payments where security uh, speed of time relevance point of sales they're all so important for any company for them to exist you know we work with aci which is one of the leaders in just in digital payments in terms of just how they could have access to our infrastructure and platform globally but also be able to reach their customers and their partners seamlessly and so we work with them now and 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 successfully been able to get this partnership working to be able to help them to have you know security as a prime uh, ingredient in the solutions that they have and and be able to help them grow and um, be able to offer the best services to their customers so just summing up again you know we know the threats that we have but we also know the demand and the opportunity that is there above for any company to exist for both of these to be able to manage properly the the key key foundation is going to be a strong digital platform and there are some ingredients that any company needs to take care of as they do that and some of these is, are the ones that we talked about and we're excited to be a small part of this whole journey to help customers uh, and in industries become successful thank you thank you so much cb that was awesome there were some questions i was uh, just uh, snooping on the questions <laughs> from some of the audience around how do we improve security across the board uh, particularly for people that come from the outside well i would say that the answer nowadays is zero trust if you are not familiar with zero trust you should probably go and read about it because this is what we are doing um, as a state of the art uh, ways to um, provide access and and, and access across uh, the internet but still have a good mechanism to identify the individuals and to authorize appropriately. Uh, when it comes to respond, typically we all have SOCs and we had SOCs for a very long time. We all, by the way, SOCs means Security Operations Center. Uh, we all uh, know how to um, run those playbooks and we know how to um, execute an incident response process. That, that's pretty well known. But what makes ransomware unique is the fact that the recovery piece, the recovery phase of, of the uh, cybersecurity response is not the same as any of the other cybersecurity um, events that we were used to. In uh, most of the cases, cybersecurity events tend to, tended to be uh, quite specific and uh, tended to potentially compromise uh, production systems, but perhaps not your recovery ability as much. 
In the case of ransomware, particularly when you see actors that are well, res well resourced and, 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 and determined, and that can uh, compromise your network and stay in your network for some time doing reconnaissance and identifying uh, your strategies to recover, they can uh, truly impact the ability to recover. They can disable your shadow copies. They can destroy your backups. They can destroy your authentication system so your restoration uh, process cannot operate because you cannot even log into your network or even run the software that you need to restore. Um, by destroying your, um, your identity or authentication database, they may also impair your ability to recover because you cannot even log in into your cloud resources if you use cloud to reprovision systems that have been damaged. Uh, so um, the area where we need to really improve is recovery. And uh, certainly, uh, even though there are some uh, new and upcoming um, techniques out there, some of them known for a very long time, like the use of, of uh, write once, read many type of media uh, or, or systems or immutable storage. Um, some others that are quite um, newer than that, uh, but it still is an area where uh, companies, uh, many times, uh, and organizations in general, may not be well prepared to respond. Um, they might have uh, run a number of tabletop exercises where they only looked at the problem as if it was affecting a particular system, when in reality it might affect the uh, overall infrastructure of that organization. So um, the um, uh, recovery plans can be limiting at best. And in many cases, um, do not consider this critical dependence across systems. I, um, in, in the past, uh, I challenged people that uh, were in the field of, of business continuity to um, um, do a little, uh, I wouldn't call it a tabletop exercise, I would say just a, a little chat with hypotheses, where I asked them, okay, um, if a ransomware really provides a, a significant destruction on our infrastructure, how would you recover? Uh, and they said, well, uh, we have our backups here in this, um, um, this backup storage system. And I said, well, what if that was compromised as well? Do you have backups offline? Um, assuming that they do, uh, then uh, they start the recovery process. I said, no, no, wait, wait. How do you start the recovery process if your restore system, your backup restore system is destroyed, the, the system itself? Um, well, uh, they install it from where? Well, they install it, but uh, where do they get the catalog of those backups? And even if they install it, uh, if that relies on authentication, but your AD system is down, now how do you even install it back and how you run it? Um, so if, if just going back to the original point where recovery tends to be the biggest uh, pain when it comes to uh, the way organizations are affected by ransomware, and which also in some cases forces organizations to pay ransoms, the um, way you prepare for those is different than the traditional threats. Typically, you need to look at into it more holistically, uh, uh, what could happen uh, in the most extreme scenarios because you cannot predict what bad actors will do. And uh, you need to look at all of those critical dependencies across systems that might be um, sometimes implicit. Uh, and if you don't document those explicitly, uh, many times your um, response and, and certainly your recovery for the, for the biggest part will be affected in a way that will uh, perhaps um, become the difference between having a company that can recover in a couple of days and perhaps get away with it, and what, than one that will end up paying the ransom and perhaps not even recover ever from there. Because even if you pay the ransom, the only thing that you can have a guarantee on is that bad actors will continue to be bad actors, right? So uh, even if they say that they will give you the key, uh, you never have any assurance that that will happen. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Villan, uh, Villan Ustre. Uh, very interesting, and, and I'm, I'm so glad you brought up uh, CISA. Uh, that's a, a very informative uh, website. Uh, for those of you that don't have access to the chat, um, go to cisa.gov, and uh, that's the website for the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency that, that uh, Dr. Villan Ustre was talking about uh, towards the beginning. He was speak, uh, specifically talking about a bulletin um, uh, alerting uh, readers to the fact that the Iranian government uh, was attacking infrastructure specifically on things like the Microsoft Exchange uh, and, and, uh, and exploiting uh, vulnerabilities in, in, that, uh, in that platform. So I'm really glad you brought that to, uh, to our atten attention, Dr. Villanustre. So we have about uh, 20 minutes left for Q&A and discussion uh, with our panelists. It looks like we have a couple questions in the chat. Um, I'll, um, 
I'll go ahead and read those aloud for the benefit of the panelists. Uh, the first comes from, uh, sorry if I'm pronouncing this right, I'm just gonna take a guess at this, David Pru uh, with a silent LX at the end. Um, his question is, cyber issues for many are quote unquote at issue. Many need to consider these challenges as a fire risk. Why? Question mark. Our home networks and our smartphones need attention and to be protected because we connect ourselves to work from there. Where can we get a legal HR policy modeled as a partner agreement to share risks and levels of security or quote unquote policy? I'll um, try a first attempt at this response. So um, you're absolutely right. Um, endpoint devices and, and particularly those um, and their networks that they are attached to can be a significant threat vector if we don't consider them. Uh, we can just not ignore that um, your home network may compromise or your phone may compromise or your computer may compromise at home. And if you access a, a sensitive resource in a corporation in some other place, um, that can uh, really expose those sensitive resources um, to uh, and, and, or the traffic that you generate in those sensitive resources as to a, an attacker, a remote attacker. Uh, unfortunately, um, there is no way to universally tackle this problem that I know of, uh, because uh, each one of those uh, home devices, if they are not managed by the corporation, uh, they might be uh, prone to having this type of issues. Um, I don't think there is a global resource. There are plenty of resources out there that tell you how to secure homes, but there is no, again, no guarantee that uh, people will be able to follow those resources. Um, sometimes for different reasons, time, uh, knowledge, um, uh, interest, or, or whatever, or, or awareness of the problem. Um, there are ways to um, handle this type of risk. Um, in many cases, uh, corporations like ours and, and many others that are very, um, very security minded will uh, provide employees with devices and uh, will require that employees use those devices that are provided from the corporation. And uh, when they um, use any resource access from those devices, the device will verify itself. We use uh, mechanisms like client certificates to validate the, uh, to authenticate the device at the same time that we are authenticating the video. There is a um, um, Microsoft driven um, concept called conditional uh, access policies. Um, where you can uh, define uh, very fine granular uh, requirements for access as part of zero trust, where you could say, I will only allow access to this particular resource if the computer comes, um, for, if the system, if the re request comes from a computer managed by the corporation and is a valid user for the corporation and it is in this geographical region uh, and it is within this time frame. Uh, and, uh, and you can come up with a number of different uh, dimensions there to, to validate. That uh, reduces the risk considerably. The home network becomes less important in that case because all the traffic will be encrypted from the end device to, uh, the, um, to the resource, to, to the server on the other side. And the home network will have less of an impact or any other network in between. After all, the internet is insecure, inherently insecure. Uh, but uh, short of that, short of what we do in large corporations where we require that only corporate managed devices have access to resources, I don't know if there is any um, global way to secure the things. And, and yeah, it is quite concerning, again, because criminal actors are after them. Um, I don't know if you follow the news, I'm sure you probably do. You know that uh, many of these home devices are recruited into, bot, into large botnets and used for, for, for harm to others. Uh, and certainly because uh, bad actors also know particularly if they are sophisticated, uh, who the employees of these large uh, corporations and juicy critical infrastructure targets are. They know potentially um, what some idea, they have some idea of their uh, personal accounts. They have some idea of their personal home networks and they may be after a um, definite attempt at compromising some of those devices if, uh, if they can. So it, it is concerning because uh, that might be a threat vector that is uh, sometimes not, um, properly analyzed and considered when doing the threat modeling exercise. And if you don't consider that, you might have an exposure. Hi, this is Jeff. I don't know if you have a, a question, but um, I know what I've also seen is uh, in the employee handbook, uh, you can have certain policies and procedures and the employee would have to sign off. Also, there's a whole new list of background checks. Uh, again, I'm, I'm talking about evolution. We used to say, okay, well, you know, or did you have a social security number and a driver's license we can compare? 
today there's all, uh, you know sexual abuse, there's uh, drug abuse, there's uh, criminal databases, there's the FBI database, there's the cyber database. So there's, there's a I have a whole resource of about 15 types of background checks that can also be performed. The mistake is that people are performing them initially upon hire and perhaps not continually. So what happens with that uh, employee who maybe 20 years down the line that, you know, had some things go wrong in their life, had a bad divorce, et cetera, um, maybe they took up an activist cause. So that should be considered as well. You know, our, the employees are our greatest asset and at the same time, they, uh, people can be our largest threat. I think I think the element that we need to also look at as we look at this new digital world of working remotely is that I know you talked about work from home and home networks, but the concept today is work from anywhere or work from just about you know any location. So it's actually larger than I would almost argue our home networks probably a little easier because of the control environment. As you're in driving a coffee, driving, being somewhere, and using your phone to access and respond to mails. It's a, you're just opening yourself to a whole bunch of um, uh, you know uh, issues that could kind of come in uh, security threat being just one of them, um, but probably the biggest. Uh, there's elements there that any organization and there's things that individuals can do, but also organizations as they architect networks on access. Where can they access it? Where are the control points? And where do they? How do they use technologies like SD WAN, which provides some level of at least control over policy that can be managed? How does that be distributed? How do you make sure that it's available globally because we're working from anywhere. People are vacationing and working and they're traveling and working. So it's, how do you get a consistent policy that can land up doing that? So I think those all are ingredients that need to be taken into account uh, when, 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 we, when we kind of not only build them, but I, I allow uh, just every stakeholder to access it. Excellent. Thank you so much uh, for each of your responses to that. Um, David had a second part to his question, uh, speaking specifically to HR policies. And I think, Stephanie, uh, you, you, you gave, um, I think you, you have addressed that question in the sense of, you know, with respect to background checks, not just being something that happens um, when a person is brought on board, but also should be performed continuously. Uh, David's question was about um, a partner agreement to share risks and levels of security or policy. Are you aware of of uh, is 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 there a um, is is this is this something that we can expect to see in business moving forward? Uh, some sort of shared uh, responsibility uh, being part of a like a like a legal partner agreement for an employee that's joining a company, and maybe this maybe it already is, and uh, and maybe that's some fine print fine print that I didn't read. But uh, can any of you speak to that point? Oh. You, so when you join a company, you're typically required to follow the policies the company has. has. And as part of those policies, you will see risk-related, risk and risk security related policies that you will need to follow as well. But it, but it is more than uh, just mandating people to do things. It, I, the federal government and the state or the state government could decide today that they want to write a law where people are forced to work on their hands. But that doesn't mean that people will be able to work on their hands. Uh, so. Um, the same applies here. It is a combination of, of policies, um, rules, essentially, and, and, and uh, enforcement of those rules. But more important, there is also training and awareness. And uh, that piece cannot be overlooked. Uh, it is absolutely key to tell individuals, employees, contractors, what uh, their responsibility is, but also how to address those risks um, if they need to address them themselves. Um, by just telling them, okay, you are not supposed to um, have um, your computer compromised. Well, that doesn't tell them um, what they should do to prevent it from being compromised in the first place. And if, uh, if this, again, as I said before, if this is so important to an organization, uh, then the organization probably need to invest some money and perhaps they need to provide those computers and they need to manage those computers centrally and they need to control the software that runs those computers, have XDR technologies on the computers, have uh, proper uh, zero trust approaches to access. So there are a number of controls that can be implemented centrally. Um, yes, there is still a responsibility on the employees. Um, phishing, one of the largest vectors uh, in number of, um, of compromise and, and ransomware spread sometimes. Um, a, also depend on the employee um, being knowledgeable and, and, and taking some action or, or, or not taking certain actions. Uh, but that doesn't go, um, none of those things go just alone. It, 
always the best security is layer security, where you don't have just one control, and if that one control fails, you're in bad shape. Um, you typically have layer controls, and if a control fails, the next one will cover some of that you know, risk, some of that risk, the extra risk of risk that you have now. Um, that's the only approach, and, and this is not different. Uh, policy alone, yeah, surely you sign when you sign your contract that you follow those policies. There are employee manuals, as it's been said already, but that's not enough. Uh, that is only one little piece of the solution puzzle. There are many other pieces that you need to also have there, or, or it won't work. And I don't know if we have uh, time much more for a response on this one, but you know, I I find that if we were to tell people, okay, you need to share uh, in the responsibility and the risk, they're going to say, well, then we're going to share in the profits. Uh, you know, I mean, it's a contract, you know, before between the employer and the employee. So what we have been doing is uh, fishing. We provide the training, and then let's see if they're actually paying attention uh, by sending out the fishing, uh, you know. Uh, lures, if you will, and then, you know, see how they do. And I know several companies that are actually giving out little gift cards and things as rewards. Um, uh, you know, when you sign on to an employee contract, you can talk about, uh, you know, must be able to travel a certain amount of uh, distance or time during the month, or you may be able to require to lift 50 pounds. Doesn't mean that that's actually your job requirement, but I think it's more of an insurance uh, you know, protection that they add in, because what if the person should uh, pick up something and, and get hurt? Um, I have seen in uh, critical infrastructure, actual personnel being uh, charged with civil penalties for um, issues where maybe, you know, there was a, an incident with the company and they were personally responsible for possibly uh, not performing their job diligently, or perhaps even hiding some of the data through a corporate audit. So in that case, you could be held responsible. It's never the case, it's always the COVID up. <laughs> <laughs> excellent points, excellent points. CB, is there anything you'd like to add to that? Um, otherwise, there's a, there's a broad question about digital infrastructure in the chat that maybe you can speak to, but do you wanna, CB, do you wanna speak to the current question about uh, HR policies? I, yeah, I think um, these are these are there are policies, and I think also organizations are all learning the new way of how to work and manage that with the workforce and just partners and stakeholders. So it's a it's a, it's a work in progress. I mean, these organizations even five years back we were not we were not geared to this level of um, uh, you know managing this in this form. So yeah, it's a, I, I don't think there's one policy that's been cast in stone uh, as yet on it and should not be. Yeah. Terrific. Thank you. Uh, the other question that was entered in the chat comes from Suresh Sharma. He asks, what is the cost of incorporating a state-of-the-art digital infrastructure um, based on whatever metric you'd like to use? And what is the refreshment cycle? Uh, what is today's refreshment cycle to update um, the infrastructure again as um, as we have rapid emergence of new technologies and new threats? Or is there a better strategy to stay ahead of the hackers instead of just constantly refreshing your infrastructure? On the on the first one, the on, on, what are the costs of the state of the art digital infrastructure? Even as I kind of talked about, there's no one magic pill, but it is also about how do you land up building a network that is able to cater to some of these vectors, whether it is speed and agility, control access to markets, serving customers and spinning up new uh, uh, you know, uh, applications as required. It, it, takes in, it, it takes into account all of these um, kind of vectors that as, as each business is, is relevant for each business, but I would argue in today's digital world, all of these vectors are relevant for everyone. Today, you can actually go launch a product in a place or in a country that you do not have a physical presence. And to be able to do that is what, is, what digital world enables. And of course, with that comes all the issues of uh, control, security, access, speed, and everything else. So I think you're going to look at some of these ingredients of what we need to grow. And this is going to be something, you, the ability to be able to scale up and down is also an advantage of digital infrastructure. So it's about what is, a, what is your level of ambition? 
and how do you want to kind of kind of keep up with that and also what's the level of demand and how do you want to grow on it unlike before this where you could say i want to build another 100000 cars and next year i'm going to put up a new factory in this place and find the cheapest place to put it up today it's that's not even relevant anymore it's about where's your ambition to grow with your products digitally and then how do you want to kind of scale it so my uh, my my short answer to a long to a question has it's got to be you got to be we have got to be at it constantly uh, on it there is no one time you can do this and get away with but as long as you're looking at these vectors and driving the advantages you can do this you can do it in in geographies locations aspects and each of them and you can take it one at a time you don't need to put this capital intensive activity that's one time that would have been the case before that's the advantage but of course with that comes up you know, the challenges too so it is it's going to be an ever constantly fed thing unlike and there's no cost of replacement or or amortization and others that used to be the, the depreciations and others that were there before we're talking about this uh, constant uh, work that needs to be done and that's exciting that's what that's what's keeping us all excited about what's going on I, I agree Thank totally you. with cb uh, it's uh you know I, I use the mindset when i'm talking to um groups uh, think like a hacker um, and also, if you remember back in TSA, we had uh, safe, safety management systems. It, it's not about uh, just doing a baseline and determining where you were and where you want to go. It's a continuous uh, evolution for efficiency and for implementing something for an issue. So you don't just put it stagnant and sit on the counter. Flavio, did you want to address that question? Otherwise, I, I have one last question I'd like to ask my, uh, um, based on some of what uh, Flavio had brought up during his talk. Um, Flavio, do you want to speak to the previous question? I, professional bias, I read that question and I see uh, vulnerability and threat management in general and threat intelligence. And, and, a, and this is a, a very uh, big uh, scope for a question, really great question. Uh, but it's um, in, from, from a cyber security standpoint, it's not just about buying the new infrastructure um, because uh, that's the initial capital investment. It is the operational uh, cost to maintain that infrastructure so that you patch and address vulnerabilities as it goes. Because no matter how well coded and how well implemented the infrastructure is, it will be vulnerable at some point. Someone will discover a hole and it will need to be addressed. Uh, so there is a, there is more to this. Um, there is a, um, a well-known cost that comes into invoice when you buy it, but there is a hidden cost if you haven't considered uh, down the road. And of course, the other piece of this is threat intelligence. Is, um, it, what I, and I think um, perhaps Stephanie uh, alluded to this, this has to do with something that is known as threat modeling. Um, you put yourself in the shoes of the attacker. You identify the threat vectors, and that's the way you determine risk. Instead of doing the um, the old ways, which used to be top down, uh, I will. I think that this thing has certain risks on this in this area, so I just flag that risk and that's it. You build your risk now bottom up. The threat modeling, you go from the uh, very basic components, you decompose the system, analyze each one of those. In this case, the piece of infrastructure might be um, a network connection between two data centers. So you look at the endpoints, you look at the uh, middle transport, you look at the potential threat vectors and you identify relevant controls that you can implement to mitigate that risk. And some of those will be uh, addressing the ongoing vulnerabilities, both for the known vulnerabilities today, but also for the unknown vulnerabilities today that will be known tomorrow. Um, and the only way is to keep surveillance and, and stay on top of it. Um, I can tell you that um, I don't know what the cost is because it depends on what you are talking about, but I can tell you that the cost is never, um, it's, it's never worse than the alternative, which is you leave it there and it will be compromised at some point, and then the cost will really, really be very high. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, well, I want to thank, uh, I think we're out of time, so I want to thank our, our, our three panelists, Stephanie Mayberry from ODX, CB Velayutan from Equinix, and uh, Flavio Milenustre from LexisNexis. Uh, Thank you so much to our panelists. Thank you, Ani, for um, for your role in in uh, allowing our panelists to get together and offer their remarks. Um, I guess that's it. So again, thank you so much to all of our panelists. It's it's a it's great to see uh, Flavio and CB again. Stephanie, I enjoyed our phone conversation yesterday. I really hope that I get to see y'all again uh, soon. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ryan. I have a uh, quick. Uh,
you know, question, a general question to the panelists here in terms of uh, the, the way when we structured is this, that uh, we, uh, in the previous session, we, uh, the panelists uh, discussed about the scarcity of talent, which we have in the cybersecurity personnel. And <laughs> since Brian is with the university, I would like the three of you to address that question respectively in your companies or companies, if you don't want to talk about your company, but outside in the industry, how you are coping up with that kind of talent? Very good. Andy, that's probably the very best question of the entire afternoon. Um, and no wonder we don't have a good answer. What we do in my organization, and again, I'm not trying to say that it's better or worse than others, but what we are doing today, because it's so hard to get good talent out from outside, is we try to do our best effort to ensure that people have uh, mobility and growth within the company. Um, so uh, that means that positions that are more um, uh, sophisticated, um, that require more expertise or, 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 or more domain knowledge are um, typically backfilled by those that are inside the company. And then uh, we try to open the certain positions to the outside, which makes it easier to find good talent. There is plenty of, of, of fresh talent out there that companies don't tap enough of universities, uh, uh, fresh graduates, uh, undergrads, people that are not going through college and still uh, have the um, experience because they've been doing this alone on, on their own or, or learning. Uh, so uh, the, that way we have managed to, um, not, I wouldn't say that we excelled at this time, uh, perhaps cope a little bit with the um, issue with uh, talent and, and recruitment. But it's a very hard problem. Unfortunately, um, it has been uh, really exacerbated over the past maybe six months. And, uh, and, and we have a number of open positions out there, but, which is a great opportunity for people that want to join the organization. I would say that if you look for a great company to work for, come to Lexus Next Free Solutions with Relics. Uh, we have plenty of opportunities and very good opportunities as well. And it's a lifetime career. Right. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> well, Flavio, I, I know you touched on uh, employee retention. Um, I, I'll share something, and that is when my, my own daughter was uh, entering into engineering, um, she was trying to determine what discipline. And okay, we think in legacy terms. Oh, okay, you've got civil, chemical, you know, electrical. But instead, she decided to go with electronic systems engineering technology. I'm like, well, wait, that's not one of the real engineering fields. Of course, it wound up being the top field now, but I think the moral of the story is we need to be open uh, to change and, and to what is it our future needs. It's no longer the legacy. And you know, I, I, I think I shared this with Brian yesterday. I've seen more people on LinkedIn lately that have added the name, the word cyber to their titles I think everyone in my LinkedIn profile has cyber in their titles now. And a couple of my, my friends, I asked myself, well, you didn't do anything with cyber before. What are you doing now? And well, you know, that's how, you know, I got to be, you know, I got in the door at such and such company. So I think it's their company's responsibility to uh, first work with educational organizations and be open for those other, uh, you know, e-sets instead of the civil. And at the same time, you know, uh, work with the, the educational systems to employ the students coming out, uh, come up with internships and, and help that next generation uh, so that they're not stuck. Um, and I, I, I think that that's your retention policy right there. I agree. Just, just, I mean, we as a company are excited about just where we are being a leader in the in the space that we are in, I think, uh, you know, it gives us also an opportunity to be able to attract some of the best talents in the world today. But having said that, we have a very robust summer internship program, which actually is just opened up now. We also have a, a graduate entry program for uh, fresh graduates coming out. And just last week, we announced we were going to go into India and open a development center there with recruiting over 500 um, um, folks in, in terms of building a team there, and which is uh, significant for a company which is 10,000 employees today, but uh, probably is a leader. So I think we're all recognizing that this is a constant area of growth for us and an opportunity to be able to get people in. So, yes. Dr. McIntyre, John, and Brian. Yes. You know, the question to both of you, you know, we're looking at both of you to have a strong army of cybersecurity experts. 
Thank you. You know, and you uh, you both have been together probably 60 years of academia under your belts. What do you think where we are? You know, we're talking about in general as a country. In general, as a country. So it, it's interesting you mention as a country because uh, um, and I'd like to get the panel's input on this. Um, there's as Flavio was giving his remarks, uh, you know, he mentioned the CISA um, uh, CISA and and I quickly uh, browsed the CISA website and looked at some of the bulletins that had come up recently. And one of them was uh, about um, uh, there's a, a new set of what what they're calling the federal government cybersecurity incident and vulnerability response playbooks. And um, and it makes me wonder, like, is this something that we necessarily want having you know publicly available? Um, it's been mentioned we need to think like a hacker and it's been mentioned today that you know we need to you know start adopting more zero trust policies and i wonder if you know as much as i try to i, I try to get my students to you know be empathetic and develop a sense of empathy in, in, in a wide variety of situations and i think this definitely you know falls into that category but when i see something like this i wonder are we potentially shooting ourselves in the foot by putting our playbooks out there for public consumption uh or is this a good thing is this a good thing to have these playbooks out there for for people to uh for hackers uh to look at and say okay well now that i know what their playbook is now i can do my counter playbook and then it becomes this sort of like cat and mouse game that uh you know it, that uh, just you know es escalating uh, threats and, and counterattacks. So I just wonder if we're we're shooting ourselves in the in the foot there. Uh, immediately with response res with response to Ani's question, I think it's incumbent upon me as a faculty member to do as much or more learning than well, do, at least do as much learning as we are expecting of the students because of of everything that is changing in terms of uh, of, of uh, you know digital infrastructure and cybersecurity threats and and all of that. I think. Um, you know, it's 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 one thing to just get a PhD and then suddenly that you know that credential magically makes you qualified to teach. But I think there needs to be um, you know a a continuous uh, expectation that we are keeping up with uh, trend uh, the the trends that are happening in computing. Um, it, it this sort of parallels uh, with what uh, with what Stephanie was saying about you know background checks. Don't just do that on do them on hire. Perform them continuously. I, I think there needs to be an expectation that faculty should right. continuously keep up their uh, skill sets to at least to the extent that they can. Um, but I am curious about you know what the panel thinks about you know having these federal playbooks out there for everybody to see. I am ambivalent on that one. <laughs> um, I do I do understand that you don't want to share every every little detail. Unfortunately, in many cases, bad actors still find out even if you don't share anything. So if you don't share, the risk is that the good actors, the ones that can help you defend, will not know about these things. And the bad actors will already know anyway. And besides, security through obscurity has never been a good recipe for security, I can tell you from personal experience. I, I totally agree with Flavio on that one. Um, what you also have to consider is the who's our criminal? Who, uh, you know, the criminal is no longer the person with the ski mask on, waving the gun, who has to have an, enough potential to actually get in the car with the driver's license and et cetera, go to a bank, physically walk in and put themselves at risk. Now it's someone, perhaps uh, a disgruntled employee or someone who feels they're entitled and they want something and they can do this hack very quickly, white collar crime sitting in their office or at home. And... You know, maybe they think it's a one-off. I'll get you know a couple yeah. million dollars, and then nice. you know I've, I'm caught up for now. So I think we have to consider, you know, not only think like a hacker is let, let's profile our hacker. Right. At Georgia Tech, we have just created a school of cybersecurity and privacy that is being put up by uh, Rich Delulo, our former dean of uh, computer engineering school. It's a six-school specialized school that he puts up. We're offering all kinds of masters online and offline. Some of them are multidisciplinary. Uh, that is to say, computing with public policy, computing with international affairs. And so we're training a new breed of cybersecurity experts, not just engineers coming out of a straight mold of, uh, uh, they, they, you're not going to pull the wool over their eyes about cross cultural issues or, uh, different parts of the world they will be knowledgeable about area studies as well as cybersecurity 
uh, plain vanilla technical technological issues. So that that is the trend. Right. And uh, I don't know how many we will be. Uh, uh, how many students will eventually come out of these programs? But our online programs, the MOOCs in particular, are in the thousands uh, in computer related fields. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that's enough to meet the demand. And I think our graduates are pretty demanding in terms of salary when they graduate. But uh, but I think that the gaps in uh, in in uh, labor market demands but might be at lower levels rather than highly trained engineers, research engineers. That's really not, not where there is a great demand. There may be a competition among countries for, for the best minds at the top level, mm -hmm. but in terms of uh, running cybersecurity operation in uh, in the floor of plants or in a branch, branch bank, uh, that's a different kind of training. It's a different kind of uh, animal that we're training for, I think. Right, right, great. Well, Dr. Canada, I want to thank you and all your panelists uh, for your wonderful remarks. <clears throat> uh, you know, this uh, topic is something which uh, we know uh, is gonna be there with us <laughs> uh, for the rest of our life for sure. And uh, with that in mind, we are planning, going to plan a bigger session, a day long session on cybersecurity related issues next year uh, sometime. So please stay tuned. I wanna thank you CB for your participation and support from Equinix. Uh, you know, we really appreciate Flavio, your time and your presentation and uh, remarks today. And Stephanie, thank you for uh, joining us. So thank you all.